Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Tonight is the night that racing at the European Endurance Sprint Series resumes at the wonderful Suzuka International Racing Circuit, broadcast live on the Total Sim Sport YouTube channel. <laughs> The circuit currently at 5.87 kilometers or 3.60 miles is cloaked in history. From the amazing center on Prost accident at first turn to the site of Michael Schumacher's first championship win in 2000. This track has seen it all. I am James Parfit and I will be shortly joined in the commentary box by the one and only Chris Rowlands. So let's talk about this amazing series. The racing will be split into three categories. LMP1s with the amazing Audi R18 and the Porsche 919s. Then we have the LMP2s with the Dallara P217. And then the GTEs consisting of Ferraris, Porsches, BMWs, Corv uh, Corvettes and Fords. Let's bring in Chris Rowland to find out what to expect from this great series. Hi, Chris, and welcome to the show. Here, this is a brilliant circuit for uh, multi-class racing, and it's a sort of sprint multi-class as well, really. So it's going to be more aggressive than endurance series for those of you who follow both real life and sim racing, endurance racing. Uh, but it's at the same time, this is the longest official sprint distance available in iRacing's official series. So there's a lot of strategy that goes into this. It's not just hard racing; the drivers have to think a bit as well. So we should be in for quite an interesting race tonight, I think. So this is going to be one awesome race this evening then. So let's take a look at the calendar. The series will run for 12 weeks, starting off in Suzuka and then heading to the famous spa Frankershop circuit in Belgium. Then on to the Brazil at the Autodroma Jose Carlos Paque Grand Prix, rounding out September's amazing circuits. Then in October, we have the Hockenheim Ring, the great Silverstone circuit, and finally Daytona International Speedway Road Course. Then in November, we have the Red Bull Ring, Watkins Glen, and the famous Autodroma Nacional Monza in Italy. Then on to Road America, and then finishing off at the very tricky Sebring circuit, where we will crown the 2021 champion. Chris, what lineup of tracks? It's going to be one great season. Yeah, not to pat one of our own on the back too much, but Sean has done an excellent job of giving the European sprint calendar a host of the best possible tracks. Uh, tonight, exclusive. So we will get on to the racing very shortly. They are just on to the practice and then the qualifying. It's lone qualifying. So we will follow all the way through. So, Chris, tracks, tell us about it. What's it how's it going to be for the season? Yeah, it's, uh, these are all sort of the classic FIA Grade 1 circuits for the most part. So it, it suits these cars because these are big, hefty cars. You need that space to race. If we took these guys to Walton Park, for example, I don't think it would lead to the most interesting racing. But Suzuka tonight, for example, I mean, it is such a challenging circuit. It's so fun to drive. It's so fun to watch guys drive it. And it just encourages good racing. I mean, think, like, for example, through the S's section. If you're in an LMP1, how on earth are you getting past some of these LMP2s or GT cars? And it's the same for the other classes as well. They've got to think about when to pick their moments to get through traffic while still driving quickly. Uh, so I think tonight, especially qualifying, is going to be very... I mean, it's always important, but it's going to be mm. especially important tonight just to make sure you've got that track position so you can get a bit of a head start with the other classes when it comes to overtaking or being overtaken by them. So where are we looking at on the track, Chris? Where are we going to see the most overtakes, do you think? Oh, well, well, we'll curse it by saying somewhere and then it turns out not to be the case. Uh, I think it depends on how brave you are through 130R because the breaking point into the Casio Triangle is probably the hardest breaking point after the longest straight on the circuit. So that's a good place to try it. Into the first turn as well. Again, it, it requires bravery and it will be different for each classes because the prototypes have got more downforce for example, uh, so they'll be able to do some silly things into the high-speed corners that the GT drivers would never in a million years attempt if they wanted to stay on the circuit. Uh, but that's not to say we won't see overtaking throughout most of the track, although, again, it depends on how much time you're willing to sacrifice 
say for example through the S's, you're going to be sacrificing a lot of time if you're not taking the optimal line single file. But if you're stuck behind someone, you're going to be desperate to get past them. Still, you've got to measure up that risk or reward. But uh, I think we're going to see most of the action into the Casio Triangle tonight. So what are we saying that wise, Chris? What do we what do we think the LMP1s are going to be catching up with the GTEs? Have you got a rough estimate for us on when you reckon? Well, the LMP1s lap around 133, 134. We've got some very quick drivers in the LMP1 field tonight. Um, not that not that that's the sole reason they're quick. Uh, so they are roughly 20 seconds a lap quicker than the GTE. So depending on the pace lap and how that works out for the guys, I think we're looking at within five or six laps, we should start seeing uh, them coming up to traffic. And of course, you've got to think as well about the LMP2 drivers, because they're sort of stuck in the middle. They've got to think about the LMP1 drivers coming through, because there's about a 10 second gap there as well. But mm. they've also got to worry about the GTEs, and they've got that just that little bit less acceleration out of the corners that the LMP1s have with their boost. So it really is a challenge if you're an LMP2 driver. And I'm not just saying that because it's the car I would drive of these three myself. But it's, it's something you really have to think about. I think when you sometimes get the lower splits in the European Sprint that don't have the LMP1 cars, it's quite nice, that's an LMP2, to suddenly be the big boy class and only have to think about going past others. But uh, there is a reason why some of these prototypes have got a reputation amongst the GT drivers for not respecting the space they require. Uh, because again, like we were saying earlier, the GTEs just don't have the same level of downforce, so they've got to take a more considered line into these corners. Sometimes you get the occasional prototype driver that doesn't notice that. Uh, but I believe we're going to grid now, James. Yeah, we are. So here's the grid. Chris, take us through the grid. Yeah, we can do that. So LMP1, we've got Carlo Labatti in first with on the front row with Jan Corbs. Uh, James Armstrong from IRUK is alongside Ta Taylor Mills in our second row. Max Hack, Will Woodland, they are the third row, followed by Danielle Pizzo and Andre Reddington. Moving on to the LMP2 grid, we have got Didier Duchateau, Robert Guilford, Rick Schiavon and Benjamin Cora. And then they will be followed by Izzo, Studensky, Roos, Barilaro, Zamora, Beb, Lemayne and Martin de Jong. And then we will move on to the GTE class. So we've got Jeremy Rouleau, Roman Verdelivo, Kirill Kolobuksov, and Aramis Gentilufiuk. Gen sorry, I'm sorry, very sorry, Aramis. Uh, uh, he's on the uh, second row there of the GTEs. Danny Gosling is in fifth, followed by Richard Simner, Matthew Kakino, Antonio Valla, Eust Decanter, Jorge Carmo. Edward Alday, Mark Collicott, Francois Watts, and Dmitry Zendrikov in a 34-car grid, which I think is a pretty nice middle ground for these guys because these splits can get up to upwards of, I think, 45 cars. Sometimes it's nicer, especially in a three-car car grid. It's just a bit nicer to not have to worry about those massive, massive groups of cars. Uh, I mean, we've still got 14 GTEs for the LMP1s mm -hmm. to get through. Uh, so I, it's a bit selfish and a bit nasty to think, but sometimes when you're in those prototypes, you're just praying that there'll be some carnage in the GTE, so you've just got slightly fewer cars to have to pick through. Obviously, we as commentators and viewers don't want to see that. We want to see nice, clean, hard racing, and I think that's what we're in store for tonight, James. What do you think? I think it's going to be an absolutely epic race, to be honest, Chris. I, I am looking forward to how this turns out. I, I think the LMP1s are... Well, I think they're going to have a mission. I've got to be honest. If they catch up with the GTEs in the wrong place, we could see some rather nasty crashes. Um,
Sean, producer Sean, who loves his four GTs. We've got no Fords in here, uh, which is a real shame. But the Corvette, the advantage of the Corvette is it's it's this is this is maybe not the most practical solution, but it's the Mario of the GTE field. It's just it doesn't excel at anything in my opinion, but it's it's just a nice all-rounder car. You you don't get too much understeer. It's pretty stable. Uh, but if you're a top quality driver, you can get that Porsche to really sing around the circuit in a way that you probably can't with the Corvette. So that will explain will be so to some extent why we've got so many Porsches. Also, not to denigrate the beautiful Corvette, but I think there's certainly a bit more history behind a Porsche as well. Ooh, Charlie Bebb getting too close to Barilaro there, Chris. Now, obviously, we're aware of Charlie in that famous livery that he's uh, used in the um, IRUK season three as uh, season three GTE uh, GT Freeze. Izzo's just, oh, he's going down into the start finish straight. Is he going to hold on to the place, Chris? What do you reckon? Well, it does look like he's currently behind Studensky there. He's flashing him there, so we're going to turn one. He's taking a very wide line, catches a little bit of grass there. You can see just how hard these guys are pushing, staying right on the track limits, willing to take those risks just to make that little extra place. Another flash there. He could just be saying, look, I'm faster than you. You worry about me coming past. And also, look at the LMP1s. Look at the track map mm. there. These guys are already coming up towards the back of the GTE field as Labatti here and Armstrong are fighting very close towards each other. Yeah, we're coming up just to the end of lap three at the moment and they've already sort of near enough caught them up. I think it's going to be interesting from now on, Chris. I think it'd be interesting to see how the likes of Corbs, Labatti and Armstrong get through these GTEs. And I think this traffic management is going to be vitally important as we look at Reddington climbing all over the back of our woodland there, coming into Triangle, Casio Triangle. It's going to be interesting as we flick on to the Watts and Gosling battle now. Oh, they're going to be through the S's, staying one behind each other. I think that's probably going to be the, uh, the favoured line. They're not going to really be looking at going down onto each other, coming into the hairpin, but it's just... It's just getting a little bit spicy, Chris. People settling down, getting into their rhythm. Lap times are coming up. It's going to yep. be the next few laps. Well, of course, the tyres would have warmed up by now, which just allows these drivers to just drive that little bit more aggressively. Uh, we're going to switch over to Studensky in P2. He's got his over company, and Roosh you just saw going wide back there, yeah. I believe. Um, but if you again, if you look at the car numbers, that's their i racing. Obviously, we don't. That's across all the things. But Sedensky there, car number 11, uh, with the uh, car number six of Izzo. Izzo's going to think there. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the higher rated driver here. I'm, I think I'm faster. He's going to want that place. As we see, Bruce has just taken Cowra before you even made it to turn one. So he's going to be nice and clear ahead into the S's. Just, just lets himself there. He'll be able to settle through the S's there, not have to worry quite so much. If you make that move into turns one and two, you've then got that driver right behind you through the S's. You can't really trust the point. And there you see with the traffic, we're seeing it already. Yes, yeah, so early on, we are literally coming up to the end of lap five, and the LMP1s are catching the GTEs. All ready as we go round to 130R through into the Casio Triangle. Is this is the problem you've got, Chris? They're catching them up at very unfortunate places. Uh, Labatt and Corte are weaving their way through as much as possible. And obviously you've got James Armstrong on the back here as we go, come on with Carroll. He, he is going currently around the outside, trying to get around the outside of Odelovio um, as he comes again into the S's. I think this is going to be not an ideal place for him. He's going to be sitting there single file for the next set of corners, I think, Chris. I don't think he's going to be making a move until he probably gets up to the hairpin. No, and he's probably going to have to start thinking about how to let these LMP1 cars through and perhaps take advantage of it if they can maybe on Verdelevo, if they do a lunge onto the inside, that's something that Kola Buxov could take advantage of. So again, this is something you've got to think about in these sprint uh, multi-class races. Uh, but another thing we've got to consider with these overtakes is their LMP1s have got their boost, so they've got that massive acceleration out of turns, as we're seeing here. Yeah. Uh, but it does often mean that you get towards the end of a straight, and it can just be a little bit more indecisive, depending on where you are and on which circuit. If it's a heavy braking zone, it can sometimes cause a bit of confusion between the classes. And of course, the LMP2s don't have that boost function, so they don't quite have the same acceleration out of corners. They've really got to nail their exits if they want to make sure they get past the GTEs. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's the thing. They've really got to be careful as well. They can't be taking unnecessary lunges. 
especially with the GTEs, because they're still going to be in a battle, Chris. They're not going to, you know, want to give way. And if, say, for instance, accidentally they've, they've, he's gone for the overtake and he's pulled out and the LMP1's decided to go up the inside, it's going to end in, um, well... Disaster, I think it, it, the often, word it often has, and it's it's some of it is a function of this being a sim, and obviously we've got the net code as well, so you have to leave that slight extra sliver of space. So we saw earlier the cars going three wide before 130R. It takes a very brave driver to do that because obviously you've got to leave that slightly extra space here. But as you see, the, the front three here in LMP2, they're still really close together, and it's now they're coming up to the uh, that's P14 in GT, I believe, who is well behind the rest of the class. So that's not quite so stressful for the guys to get past because generally when you're out of sync like that um, you, you generally get out of the way a bit easier because it's in your interests as well unfortunately Charlie Bev we've already lost him from the LMP2 field mm. it does feel like every time specifically myself broadcast with uh, Charlie Racing he always seems to crash he's a very quick driver but it just shows you the strength of the field that someone like Charlie can already be uh, shunted out of it sadly yeah, as we got Stadensky there trying to go up the inside of the Casio Triangle, I don't really feel he was in the position there to be sticking his nose out. Oh, it, no, he was defending from Izzo, sorry, my mistake. He's, he's got, obviously, uh, we switch over to Kanto at the moment. Uh, oh, he is uh, pushing through at the moment. He's got Carmo coming up right behind him, coming into the hairpin. He's pushing car 19 at the moment as they come into the hairpin. Again, now, these have got the LMP2s coming up behind them, Chris. What do you think your mindset would be in a GTE? Are you going to be looking to carry on with the battle in front, or are you going to be looking to jump out of the way? What's, what would you say the situation, your mindset, would be if you were racing? Well, I think with the GTEs, the sort of prevailing wisdom is it's better for them to stick to their lines. Um, we're going to switch to a G, uh, an LMP, LMP overtake. This is James Armstrong we're on board with. You can see already some more traffic here and some more traffic here and then some more traffic here he's done very well to thread the needle here but we've still got yet more coming up ahead and this is one of the more awkward places to encounter them mm. but yeah so with the gtes you generally you sort of you stick to your line and the guys have to get round you obviously you don't want to be blocking them and you want to assist them getting past as much as you can it's going to be in your i think mean, you don't want to fully lift off because if you are battling with someone you want to stay in their draft but the chances are they'll get caught out later on anyway they'll have to lose up some time but again keeping that draft and you're seeing a lot of these cars are paired off so you can mm. see here we've got Lavati here he's in a pair with another MP2 we've got that in across all the three fields and it's often they're not doing it deliberately but the drivers are sort of working together a bit here again another example GTE they're paired off and you've got Co Collar Books off here yeah he might well be quicker but you know we've, we've still got 45 well 47 minutes left for this race if he can sit behind the number two of Verdelevo for just you know another 20 minutes, that pit stop could be two or three seconds quicker, and suddenly he's out in front with just 15 minutes to go. So you don't necessarily want to be making that overtaking opportunity this early in the race. So he's going to trust his own pace, and we'll see if that pays off for him. Yeah, as he come down into the hairpin at the moment, we've got color box of him, Verdelevo. As we've got Labatti, he has got Mills right up behind him, coming into the Casio Triangle. Mills is attacking at the moment. Mills right up behind Labatti at the moment. Would you reckon Chris is going to have a go down into turn one? We've obviously got Labatti right out on the right hand side of the track. And Mills hasn't really tucked in on the uh, draft like I thought he would have done going into the first turn there. And no, he's dropped it's... back. I think it's just an indication with your car's body language there. He's just saying, look, I want to get past you, but I'm not going to make this the most difficult thing in the world. If, you, if you're desperate to get past, you're going to follow behind in the slipstream, because uh, Labati is actually, it appears, running a lower wing. He was going faster there on the straight than Mills was. Um, although, having said that, the top speed for Mills has maxed out eight, eight miles an hour quicker there. Uh, although that will, of course, be thanks to the draft. As again, we're seeing Kolo Buxov, he's right behind Verdelevo here, but he, again, car body language. He's not he's not dipping out on the outside. He's not sort of letting him know he's there, as a valet is having to take advantage of Gosling's going wide there. Yeah, it looks like he has. Yeah, Gosling leaves him uh, quite a bit of room there, Chris, to be fair. I think Gosling just outbroke himself coming into the corner. There, went for the overtake and missed it, unfortunately, but... He left in room, which is always good to see. He didn't come rushing straight back in as we switch on to board with Richard Sinna. Now, he's got Carmo coming up behind him. Carmo looks very racy at the moment. 
as you say, we've still got 45 minutes, Chris. What, you know, where would you go with your mindset? Would you be looking to push and grab them places, or would you just wait for the mistakes to happen? Well, I think any racing driver is going to want to push as much as possible. However, I'm I'm personally quite a chilled out guy. It's why I don't do very well in these Z races. Zamora Barilaro has just got past Zamora there, Chris. Sorry, going into turn one as they head up into the S's. Zamora now just takes single file again through to the S's. Seems to be the theme, doesn't it, Chris? It was single file through the S's. Yep, it's like we were saying, although we were saying that the Casio Triangle would see the most overtakes, and so far it's been turn one. I think we've underestimated, or certainly I've underestimated, just how much speed they can carry through turn one into that second part of it, to the right hand and board the S's. And also, it's quite a long main straight, really, so you can mm. you can really utilise the draft here. As Lovato actually looks like, might be pulling slightly ahead of Mills, and that looks like James Armstrong. Ooh. Right. That was, a, that was not, that was an LMP2. No. That was an LMP2 there, jumping out of his way. I think we've still got Collar, collar Box off, still sitting behind Verda Livio. They're coming in down into the Casio Triangle. He, he, he's, he's battle for P1 in GT. He's got to be. Is he getting anxious? Is Collar Box off sitting there thinking, I am quicker than you, and I really want to be getting through as they head over to the start finish rate? He's going to be picking up the toe, Chris. Is he going to make this move into turn one, or will he sit and wait? Because if he waits, he's waiting for the other side of the S's, isn't he? Yeah, well, this is again, he's he's not tucking out. He's going to make a late move. It looks like he is. He's yeah, he's he's he he's 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 inside there. though, Chris, that's the thing. That is a very planted looking Porsche to me. There was no mm. real trouble with him making an overtake there. It will be interesting to see now how much to th how much is he going to be able to pull away? Will he be able to get Verde Levo out of the draft range? Because that's where he's really going to see the advantage in terms of trying to stay out ahead of the pit stop. Will Verde Levo now look at maybe doing an undercut? He's probably not going to have the fuel advantage, so it might well not work. Of course, it depends where he fills out into traffic as well. Mm, I, I think we're going to have to just keep an eye on this one. He's pulled out half a second already, but as you say, we, you know, it's going to be an interesting day. He's jumped on Richard Guilford, weaving his, way, uh, weaving his way through traffic there as well. Um, this is the situation with LMP2s, isn't it? They've got the GTEs, they've been a lap, they've got the LMP1s coming up behind them as well. Your mindset is completely different in an LMP2, Chris, isn't it, really? Yes, it definitely is, and I think you really have to focus on making sure your corner exit is good, because if you slightly mess it up, the GTEs are not actually that much slower in a straight line, certainly out of the exit of the corner. So if you mess that up, if you break too late, if you go in too deep, you're going to really struggle to get past those GTEs. And of course, they're in their own battle. They don't want to mm. give up the positions they've got. Well, this is what we're looking at now. We've got Will Woodland, Will Woodland weaving his way through traffic as they come down into Spoon at the moment. He, you know, we flick, goes up Labatti behind Taylor Mills at the moment. Now, Labatti, he's got to be sitting there thinking, he's coming onto this back straight now. He can clearly see that Mills is going to have traffic in front of him as well. He's got to be looking at taking his taking his chance. But look at the traffic in front, Chris. Where is he going to go? Yeah, it's... We've got uh, Reddington now. They are there as well, blimey. Yeah. That's a, a brave that's, prototype drivers. Yeah, that's a brave move coming in, uh, getting it done there. But he, he seems to have done it clearly. And now Will, the, he's got the traffic in front. He's got the LMP2. But look at the traffic, Chris. It is just GTEs, LMP2s. It's absolutely chaotic and we've got Charlie Bebb sitting in the middle not really sure which way to go you know yeah. there's a lot to think about and as you see we've got somebody off there as well Valley sitting in the middle he's off at, who was that that went off there I missed who that I think was, uh, uh, Roliu in the GTEs looks to be dropping a few places so it wouldn't surprise me if that was him um, although it might well be more than one car this is honestly this is uh, chaotic that's glad to be in the commentary box rather than on the track right now because that is a lot of information to have to process as a driver and of course 20 minutes of racing they're going to be mentally fatigued already at this point it's exhausting to have to worry you worry about your own class worrying about the others all three classes on the same straight mm -hmm. there knowing as well that hey, it's going to be difficult to do anything into the s's so if you don't clear that whole lot of traffic you're going to lose so much time in that first sector of suzuki here it's one of the really interesting challenges it's pretty much specific to this track, I'd say, for the calendar. There's not many other circuits where the entirety of Sector 1 is pretty much a no-pass zone. Um, so I'm surprised we've not seen some more aggressive behaviour into Turn 1 as we've come through traffic. Yeah, James Armstrong there, weaving his, round for his, his, weaving his way through Spoon at the moment. He's got Guildford here. He has got 
dash or two in, uh, behind him is again you've got the same situation with traffic as well and it's just I can't see how Dashito is going to get through coming into the Casio Triangle. He's got LMP1 coming up as well. He's not going to be looking at making his move because he just physically can't, Chris, can he? He's got the LMP1 out there. He can't pull out. He's got more LMP1s coming through. It's such a dangerous game. Oh! That was the 5 and the 11. That was Stadensky and Siobhan. Yeah, that was... Oh, that'd be good to see what happened there. That is, unfortunately, Chris, as we say, when we're talking about traffic, that's the proof of what we've got, isn't it? That's such a dangerous game when you're trying to weave through and you've got other cars battling as well. You know, yeah, this I is was, a battle I for was, I was thinking what a beautiful sight it was, all those cars coming down the main straight. But of course, you know, you've got three... Oh, I think there's a little bit of net code in there as well. The number five looked to have been bumped ever so slightly by the car on the inside, even though there was clearly a gap there, because I don't think Siobhan actually moved on the straight there. But, no. uh, it, that's, again, that's all it takes, just these tiny little movements, and that is unfortunately for Shivon, that's his race ended. Yeah, that's not going to be looking good at the moment, is it? As we've got Ashito still being chased down by Richard Guilford in the LMP2 uh, position there. We've got Max Hack, unfortunately. Let's see what happens to Max. Ooh! Just too much curb there, Chris, and that was it, wasn't it? These cars yeah. don't like curbs, and I think Max has unfortunately just rather found that out. Yep, yeah, that's the second one we've seen. They have just done that curb on Degner, and it's completely wrecked their race, but we also saw another two or three cars going off track there as well, so it's, it looks like it's the part of the track they're struggling on the most at the moment, and again, it's probably that desperation from having just had to follow other classes all through the S's, mm. although, again, Degner is not the easiest place to be making an overtake, but you're going to be so frustrated by that point, but I don't know if you, you can still see it on the track map now, but a lap or two ago, we had the entire field occupying basically one sector of the track, the other two sectors completely devoid of any cars whatsoever, so no wonder we're seeing these increase of incidents here. Yeah, we're going to jump onto Danny Gosling. He's coming into the 130 at the moment. He's chasing Valet down as well. Ooh, there's a slight little nudge coming into the Casio Triangle as they go through the Casio Triangle as they were. We've got Gosling behind Valet. He's got an LMP2 car though, Chris, and this is the situation with it. You know, they're going to climb up to get up to the cars like they are. And we've seen this so many times where they've just got to sort of settle again because they've got an LMP2 or an LMP1. And now Goslin is stuck behind Valley, going around into first turn. He's going to be round there, we, as, we, as we've said numerous times, up through the S's. And he's not going to be able to make his move, is he? No, that's exactly right. And Beb there is defending from the number seven leader of the GTE's collar books of, who has not been able to get away from Verdolivo. Again, that's probably the traffic to some extent because he's still within a second, but they've now mm. got that nice, comfortable five and a half uh, gap back to the number 16 car, who himself is sort of in a race of his own at the moment. But of course, plenty of time till we get to the pit window. So this is not the settled order so far. LMP1s, it looks like quite a few guys there, uh, Reddington for example, he started at the back of uh, LMP1, he's currently up to third, and he's not exactly, you know, he's with Mills, so there's still plenty going on there, it looks like the traffic has really shaken up the order there, Armstrong was in second at one point, and he's yeah. down into fifth. And that's the thing with traffic, you can instantly, if you take the wrong side on a GTE or an LMP2, you know, Armstrong may have just taken the wrong side, and unfortunately, he's just been... Everybody else has just gone past him, Woodland, Reddington and Mills, and he's just down, unfortunately, now down in fifth place. And that's the thing, Kolobokstov here seems to have been pulling out. He was out at one point, a point eight of a second. Um, as we could with James Armstrong. Ooh, yeah, run wide there, Chris, and that's, that's it, unfortunately. He's just bouncing across the curb, but going into the S's. Credit to James Armstrong for holding that, because I'm pretty sure if that was me or you, Chris, our back end would have decided to come and join the front of us. Yeah, it shows you the supreme car control these top guys have got, that he kept that in a straight line, going quickly, and rejoined. And it looks like with minimal damage, if he was driving an open wheeler, that would probably be costing him quite a lot of time now. Uh, these cars, of course, are still relatively sensitive to the loss of aerodynamic parts, but it's not quite so severe as you'd see in Formula 3, for example, or Formula Renault. So he'll hopefully be able to keep going. He's still in fifth. It's actually, yeah, his last lap was his best lap, so he's clearly not struggling too much. Um, mm. At 135.69, uh, which puts within half a second of the quickest lap in the LMP1 field, which is Curves, who's having a pretty uninterrupted race. He's opening the lead, um, doing all right, and this is for position as well in GTE, James. 
Yeah, Valley and Goslin still having their little battle as they have been through most of the time. Unfortunately, they're catching up with Simlar at the moment. And now he's obviously going to be looking back and you can see these two guys going at it. Is he going to be sitting there thinking, I've got to push as fast as I can? Or is he going to be sitting there going, I've just got to do my thing? Oh, there he goes. You see Valley run wide. Goslin's opportunity going up the inside as they come down into the hairpin. We got Valley on the inside, Goslin on the right, and it's going to be an interesting. Nope, that's it. I think Goslin's got that one there, Chris, and Valley's just settled in again behind him to go again. So that gives Simnar a break, at least, you know, until they get down into the Casio Triangle. And he's got to be sitting there just thinking, I'm just going to do my thing, isn't he? Richard's just got to be sitting there thinking, I'm going to do my thing, Chris. Yep, this is the point of the race where any time you can get just that little bit of clear air, you are thanking your lucky stars. No, you can just start pumping away the lap times, which really, after 25 minutes of racing, you can. That's this is this is really quite a crucial point of the race. Obviously, every lap is quite important, but when you get these bits of clear air, you can start pushing. The tyres at this point are pretty much in their optimum window. You can you can really you can really start throwing the car around if you don't have to worry about other cars. And you can see here the LMP ones are still really tightly bunched together as Reddington's taking on Mills. Yeah, we've got Reddington and Mills going through the S's at the moment. Again, they are very close together, coming round into the back straight, aren't they? Down the spoon, um, down the back straight at the moment. Now, what is what are we going to be looking at? What is Reddington going to be thinking? Is he going to go defensive on the inside into the Casio Triangle and make Reddington go the long way? Let's have a look as we come down now. See, there's not much movement there at all, was there? It's just it's just single file all the way through, Chris. I think he's got to be looking at down, down, down the straight as we come down now. We're still on board with Mills. He's still defensive from Reddington there as well. Takes the inside line coming down. He's going to make him go the long way round as he goes round it into turn, into the first turn. Is he going to be taking him on the outside, Chris? What do you reckon? That is top quality driving from both guys there. Mills mm. got a very good launch out of the last corner and he made it work. Of course, you don't want to do anything too aggressive because you've got Woodland and Armstrong right behind. They're just being patient for now, but there's only so long they're going to want to do that for. Oh, as we see Armstrong there. Diving the inside. Yeah, Woodland has up by the there and Armstrong has been right there just to take advantage of that. So he's recovered one more position. Um, if you're Mills and Reddington, though, it might be worth thinking about trying to work together a little bit because Kerbs is only seven seconds up the road. That is not insurmountable. All that takes is one dodgy bit of traffic or one dodgy pit stop. And, mm. you know, the race win is still within reach for any of these four guys. Uh, so, yeah, Jan Kerbs so far has had a pretty, pretty quiet race. And the nice thing for him there is that means he's not having to take re unnecessary risks with traffic because... He's got that seven second gap. He's the fastest guy on the track. He's the, uh, uh, nearly lapping in the 35s last lap, the only one to get close to them. Um, see here how he deals with multiple classes worth of traffic. He's dealing with the GTEs all right. I don't think he'll be get to catching up with the prototypes before 130R, and it would be chaos if he did, because they're fighting, as you can see there. Mm. And that's the thing, we've got James Armstrong sitting behind Reddington and Mills, who are still going at each other, coming down into the Casio Triangle at the moment. You know, we've got Reddington in the front, Mills sitting behind, and Armstrong just sitting there, almost looking like he's just rubbing his feet. Oh, pit stops at LMP1 already. Was that intentional, Chris? Oh, yeah. there's contact in the pit lane. Yep, they've, they've slowed down at different rates there. They've reacted to each other, and I don't think that was worth it for two or three of the, two of the three of those guys. Um, mm. Because if they'd have stayed out, they could just, you know, focus on getting one more strong outlap out. And they've just, they've just, you know, lost a bit of time and probably picked up some damage that now need repairing. Well, we've got James Armstrong jugging a cone with him, Chris, in the, in the pits there, just sitting under it, uh, under his front wing quite happily. Um, so let's just see it. That will come out as well. So let's have a look here what happened. Tadinsky. Chris, help me out. My camera is flicked off. Oh, the, yeah, uh... He's just lost it on, I believe that's Spoon. Yep. He's recovered. He's still running in fourth, um, but that would be very frustrating. It's such an easy corner to do that on because you're pushing so hard. You want to get that perfect exit. So you, sometimes you get the power down that little bit too early. Maybe the tyres are just beginning to drop off that little bit. The track is getting that little bit hotter. And it takes a very marginal issue. And oh, you can see some contact like, there. Yeah, that was into the pits, wasn't it? And of course, the GTE wasn't to know that these guys were hitting. That Look just... Looks oh a bit dear. silly for all three, really, but, you know, it's these split-second decisions. Sometimes they, you make the wrong one, and that's so easily done, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah that's the thing. They, they didn't all go into the... They went all in at 
the same time, Chris, but it didn't look very tidy going in, did they? It, it, you know, we got Armstrong coming out first. He's come out in front of Mills and Reddington, which would be good to him. You know, I think you've got to be looking at repairs, optional repairs, and seeing seeing what happens. We've, ne we've now got Corbs, who is literally one lap ahead of these guys. And I think as long as he keeps it clean with 30 minutes to go, Chris, I, there's, you know, there's not going to be a lot of competition for the rest of the race for him. What do you reckon? I don't, I don't want to curse him by saying it's in the bag because he's still got 30 minutes of racing and he's still got to make a pit stop. And we've already seen what happens in LMP1 if you make a pit stop. Bad things seem to happen. But of course, that's, that can only be an advantage for him. And the other one to really get the benefit of that is obviously going to be Woodland, who was the one car of the four in that battle that didn't pit. He's got mm. himself some nice clean air now. Let's see what he can do with it. I think that's the thing. He's now obviously come down. He's coming down into the headpin. I think he come out of that kind of the winner, didn't he? Really, because the, the other three had a really scrappy entry, you know. And I think he really did benefit from the fact that a he, did, he didn't carry. He just carried on, and now he's just giving himself clean air to push, get into his rhythm, and, and carry on from there, isn't it? You know, as we come on board with Mark Collicott at the moment, he is going through what's uh, um, coming down into. The, he's going to be coming up to the run up to the hairpin. He's got to be looking at, if he's going to take this move, he's got to be looking at either coming up the inside of what's now, or he's going to be sitting there waiting for the back straight. He's, he's, he just shows his nose coming into the hairpin there, Chris. He doesn't really possess it, doesn't really commit to the uh, entry. So he's going to be sitting waiting, isn't he, at the back, I think. Yeah, and we're going to have a look at a replay now of an incident. This is Yong, Martin de Jong, and that's through 130 r and Cora. And, yep, yeah, I'm surprised that we've had to wait for 30 minutes to see our first incident into 130R. And then, I think, under a bit of uh, stress from the adrenaline of that, just outbreaks himself into the Casio Triangle as well. I've been there. I very much sympathise with him. We, I think a lot of us don't fall. But that was probably the oh. move. And that is Cora's that's, race over, yeah. unfortunately. Um, that's that all finished. Not what we like to see, sadly. It's why you don't generally see re uh, drivers in real life making moves into 130R because of the sheer risk of it. Uh, mm. But it looks like Verdelevo has possibly had an incident at some point because Colin yeah. Boxoff has pulled out six seconds on him. I think he was looking racy anyway, Colin Boxoff, and I think he was just waiting to get past Verdelevo and really push on because since he's pushed on, he, he as I say, we've got to the guy coming up to six seconds at the moment. And he's really, really put the hammer down to make that gap as, as much as possible. Yeah, he's got uh, LMP1 coming up to the hairpin, which is just either he just stays on his line, the LMP1 goes round. Coming into the hairpin, no pro problem. And Collar Box Off is looking rather comfortable in first at the moment, Chris. Yes, he is indeed. This is a bit closer in LMP2 here, where we've got Duchateau and Guildford, and we've not really seen a huge amount of these guys. They've kept it clean so far. Mm. Uh, they started on the front row in this class as well. So this just goes to show you the advantage of these guys haven't, you know, they've not been picking at each other. They've just been drive driving cleanly, pushing hard. We'll see how much Guildford's been able to take advantage of being within that draft range and make probably not being able to lift and fuel safe but certainly being in the draft is worth a few litres of fuel by pit stop time and of course these guys are still to pit the, mm. the drivers are all a bit more spread out now sometimes it's worth deciding on that pit stop depending on the traffic so we'll see if one of these guys jumps first the undercut can often be quite powerful in these multi-path races as well with the pit stops so we'll just have to see this this is developing quite nicely this battle between the two of them and of course again one incident between two of them and you've only got Itso and Studensky eight and ten seconds down the road they're not out of it either really and that's the thing but the problem is is looking at the trap map Chris there's just no physical room you know as we watch it uh, Didier there just weave his through weave his way through his ears but there's just no physical clear gap is there to to come out and still be comfortable with it you know, uh, it We've got a lot more information available to us than most of these drivers will be. Charlie Bebbit appears as unfortunately crashed again. We might be able to have a look at that, or I'm sure Charlie won't be thanking us for it. So we'll see what he's done. This is into the hairpin, I think, James. Yeah, unfortunately, I seem to be having some technical issues with my replays there, Chris. So, uh, uh, he's, he's, he's just lost, lost it on the end of the corner. He's yeah, just going through the end of the corner. He's just put the power down a little bit too early. I think possibly a little bit of anxiety about, you know, Having had an issue, you end up pushing a bit too hard sometimes when you're at the back of the grid because you just want to you want to make up for the fact there. That is quite. I don't know if that's a bumpy pit lane, but mm. uh, Guildford there. Uh, that did not look healthy, but it might just be his individual individual pit lane. Maybe we can get in contact with the uh, uh, engineers at Suzuka and they can resurface that for us for next time out. 
Yeah, yeah he, he did look a little bit uncomfortable going down as he was bobbling down at one point. But this re this releases Deshito now, doesn't it? Just to be comfortable settling again. He knows it, that, that Guilford's gone in. He's got to be looking at, he's just got to put in as fast of a lap time as possible and really just put the hammer down as much as he can to get as clear back as we watch Guilford coming out the pits. But unfortunately, he's come out right in front of Labatti, which is n a, a never a good position considering you're gonna, you've got to let him, you know, move over and let, allow Labatti through, I would have thought. Again, yeah. it's coming Although, into that S's period, Chris, isn't it? Yeah, it will depend on how racy Labatti feels because he's not really in that top four battle in LMP1. They've done it nice and cleanly there. Um, so no real worries, not much time lost. Uh, let's have a look at Gabriel Roos, who I believe is with Guilford. And, oh, that's number 12 there. That's Pizzo in the LMP1, just avoiding the contact, thankfully. And, yeah, he's got through nice and safely. So we'll keep going. Yeah, I think we're just still on board with Labatti at the moment. He's, he's obviously got a, looking at a 25-second gap to Woodland. You know, he's going to be sitting there quite comfortable at the moment. He knows he can go on. He hasn't got traffic now. He's not, not going to hit a GT3 and until after Spoon going down the back straight, which allows him to go through quite cleanly. So he's not going to be held up as much as some of the other LMP ones that we've seen have really struggled in traffic. You know, as we see an LMP1 here going from past an LMP2, he's going to be hitting that next LMP2. It's going to be difficult for him coming this late into the race, isn't it? With tiredness and things like that. They've been going nearly 35 minutes, Chris. Yep, and they've been pushing hard. One thing we've missed, actually, is that Woodland has jumped Curbs in the pit lane. Um, Woodland was only stopped for 12 seconds to Curbs' is 25, and he's actually got that five-second lead now over him. When Labatti comes into pit, Woodland is going to inherit the lead of this race, so uh, it'll be interesting to see what's done there. And Labatti's coming now. He was the last LMP1 to make his pit stop. They have uh, they are restricted on their fuel tanks here, so they do have to pit quite early. They've got a much smaller pit window than the uh, GTEs in particular. Well, we've got Woodland coming down into Casio Triangle, Chris. We've still got Labatti in the pits at the moment. It's going to be an interesting... We've got a slight GT, he's maybe held him up a little bit, but I think Woodland may take this lead, Chris. I think this is it. This is yep. definitely going to be the one as Woodland goes past Labatti into the lead of LMP1s. That's very unexpected, but he managed that pit lane, didn't they? The other guys have Armstrong and Mills and Reddington had a bit of a scrappy incident. And it just goes to show the time they've lost that has allowed Woodland now to lead LMP1. Yep, although he is going to have curbs just about in his mirrors. He's only five seconds down the road, mm. and we've already seen he is the fastest driver on the track. His best time is a full eight tenths quicker than Woodland's. So I do wonder if with 23 minutes to go, are the nerves going to start kicking in for Woodland as he sees that gap potentially coming down? Uh, curbs is obviously going to be frustrated that he is uh, behind there. You can see a bit of damage to the back of that LMP1, so perhaps he just had to do a little bit of repairs or just took some optionals, perhaps. Uh, so maybe he'll have... Uh, he'll still... You know, he's got 22 minutes left to go. That's going to work out at, I think, roughly 10 laps or so, maybe a bit more, mm. maybe 11. So, you know, that's half a tenth a lap. And with the amount of traffic that's going to cause issues for these guys, if you get lucky, that's a gap that you can definitely bring down. So this race is far from over, so we've got all of the top three LMP2 drivers in the pit. Yeah, we've got Guilford coming now down as he comes into the Casio Triangle. He's got uh, Didier Dashito and Stadinsky and Izzo into the pits at the moment. Now, this is his opportunity, didn't he? If he actually nailed that outlap from the pits, he could. He literally looks like he's going to be taking... Oh, I think he's not because he'll be catching him as he comes out. Is he going to be taken? He's going to be... Yeah, he lost a lot of time with Izzo and Sadinsky coming out of the pits as well. And Guilford, that was... Oh, he's back four seconds on Dash to Toe now, Chris. And again, 22 minutes. What's his going to be his mindset? Is he going to be looking to push and catch up? Or is he going to be settling for that second place, do you think? Well, I think where these guys, their timings have been pretty identical throughout the race. It's going to be, I know the gap is smaller than the one we were talking about from Woodland and Curbs, but I guess if they, unless there's any traffic, I think it's going to really struggle to get back up to him because these guys have been running pretty much identically the entire race. So unless Duchateau really struggles with the sort of pressure towards the end of the race, I think that Guildford might have to settle for second. Yeah, there's no big difference between their lap times. The best lap times, Deschateau's done a 144.6, Guilford's done a 144.65, where Deschateau did a 6.1. So they're sort of, they're round about the same lap times continue. So I can't really see, unless Deschateau has a major issue with traffic, I, I think Guilford is unfortunately going to be settled in that second place. 
He might just push around as it, you know, just keep trying to do his thing, get his line, try and pick it up quicker and quicker and quicker, because it's a lot easier in a clear track, isn't it? Than whether, when you're zooming in and out because you've got GTEs and then you've got LMPs. He's, you know, he, he can physically see that so. So again, that racing mentality might allow him to all of a sudden find speed from somewhere that for whatever reason, that happens to the best of us, Chris. Yep, and if you look on that track map in the top right-hand side, you can see that Duchateau, he's not got a huge amount of traffic to worry about in the next sort of 30 seconds worth of track. So he can really focus now on getting those strong lap times in and really hammering home that advantage he's got. As we look here at another overtake through 130R, that was a lot cleaner than the last one we saw from the LMP2s. Is he going to be able to hold it through the Casio Triangle? Looks like he's actually well clear. Yeah. A bit more conservatively there, I think, James. Yeah, I think so. But Valley got a very slow exit coming out of uh, the, the last corner there, Chris. So it'd be interesting to see what happened down the straight. As we've got Izzo now with Stadinsky right up behind it. Uh, again, they've got to move over for the LMP1s. And this just gives Izzo that break, doesn't it? When he, he's, you know, Stadinsky's moved over first because he's had to. And Izzo's now got to pick his place. And it isn't going to be through these essence. He's going to be trying moving out of the way as much as he possibly can. There you go. And he hasn't lost a massive amount of time. He's opened up 1.35 seconds on Stadinsky. So, he's a really come out the winner there. Yep. And if we go like the uh, Valet Gosling battle earlier, Gosling just tucked in behind into turn one. He didn't look to press the advantage quite there. So, we're now with Roos and Zamora, I believe. Uh, in GTE, uh, Zamora has gained three places from where he started. Roos has, has sort of stayed where he is, so they'll both be sort of trying to just get any little advantage they can here, while also not worrying too much about the traffic. Again, it's just it's not quite as uh, manic as it was as we saw on the main straight about 20 minutes ago in this race, or it seemed the entire field was coming down the main straight at once. The entire LMP2 field has now pitted, so this is all for track position. Yeah, I think that's going to be the interesting thing with Ruse at the moment. He's, he, you know, he's not massively slower on in conjunction with best lap times, but he, he's got to be looking at what he's going to be doing. He's going to be pushing as hard as he can, isn't he? Because, you know, see the car, he's got to be going for it as much as possible. You know, it's the it's same Izzo, Izzo here. He's got Stadinsky now, 0 0.69 seconds coming up. Stadinsky's going to catch the draft. Izzo's is, is, is weaving on the... Oh, it comes onto the left-hand side of the track as we look at the track now. Coming down into first turn with Stadinsky still right behind him. It's, again, they're going to be single file going into the S's, Chris. So, you know, Stadinsky's going to be looking at, again, the hairpin. Maybe coming down into Spoon and onto the back straight. And it, but it's going to be sat there for half a lap, I think. He is, and something's happened to the lead of this class because Duchateau and Guildford are now back to a second between the two of them. So I don't know, Duchateau's last lap was three seconds slower, but we knew the gap was a bit bigger than that. So I guess Duchateau's either had an off somewhere or really struggled with the traffic because mm. that is that gap. That gap has completely gone. It looks like it looks like it might well have just been traffic because yeah, there's nothing to indicate that Duchateau's had an off. Guildford has now got him in his sights and the LMP2 race is hotting right up. I think that's the thing. We said it earlier, earlier, Chris, as well. Guildford could see Duchateau now. He could, he could see him coming down the straight and it's that driver's mentality where you all of a sudden are just finding speed from nowhere and nowhere and nowhere. And if Duchateau has struggled with traffic, you know, that allows Guildford to literally close right up. He, he's not losing time letting the LMP1s through. You know, you have just so tucked in there, but I think at the end of the day, I think Guildford is could be in a strong position as we as they come down into the Casio Triangle. It's going to be letting the oh, he's not going to do it. He's going to let the LMP1 down and look through on the straight. And Guildford's still in that strong position, Chris. And I think Guildford's got a, an excellent opportunity if he keeps up with the pushing that he has done. Yep, and you saw Labatti there trying to get through, although Labatti's not really racing anyone at the moment, so it's not going to cost him too badly that he was held up there, and thankfully it's not interfered with the LMP2 race. Uh, Colourboxov has pitted from the lead of GTE and retained the lead with a four-second gap back to Verdolivo. So we're just getting through to the, towards the end of the pit window in GTEs. It's just uh, Zendrikov left to pit, who's just come in, actually. Mm. He, could hear, he could hear us talking about him. And that will mean the entire field has now pitted. So this is all going to be for track position, everything we see now. Uh, and I think at the moment, the closest battle is going to be the lead for the LMP2. So that's quite exciting, isn't it, James? I think, to be honest, because I think Guilford's going to be on a complete and utter march now. He's going to be trying to get out to the back of Deshto as soon as possible. 
you know, as I say, there's not a massive, there's a massive, there's not a massive difference in lap times. He's literally right up behind him now, and Guildford is going to be catching that toe. And I think, I don't think it's going to be long till Guildford takes a lead. Maybe with a, coming down into the back corner. What do you reckon, Chris? It really depends on how aggressive he wants to be and how much he trusts in his own pace versus Duchateau's. Because there's still 15 minutes to go. If you just spend that 15 minutes with Duchateau right behind you, it is honestly, it's so much easier to follow a car than lead a car. So you, it's almost worth, in my opinion, if you don't think you're going to... So you can see there the swipe across. He's defending his line. He's trying to break the toe there, Duchateau. Uh, but are we going to see... I don't think we're going to see a move just yet. I think if, if I were Guildford, and I'm not the raciest person in the world, I would be holding off for five, ten minutes. Just research how Duchateau is taking these corners on the very worn-out tyres now. Although Duchateau is beginning to defend, mm. James. So we'll see if something happens here in turn one. Yeah, I think Guildford now is going to, as he dies down and inside in, in first turn. Oh, just your toe runs slowly away. Guildford comes up the inside, still hugging that inside line. But now we approach the uh, SS section. And we know, oh, they try to go through there two wide, side by side, all the way through. Coming now, oh, that Guildford tucks in back behind just I think, uh, Chris, I think it's not going to be long. I think Guildford's going to be... Uh, Getting very impatient, and I think coming into the uh, hairpin, I wouldn't be surprised if Guilford makes his move. The quality of the driving from both guys here has been brilliant, but Duchateau, especially going around the outside of turn one to retain his position there, he'll be very pleased with himself for that. Unfortunately for him, he's got nearly 15 more minutes of this to try and do if he wants to keep the lead for LMP2. Of course, it's not all going to be over. If he can stay in Guildford's draft, again, all it would take is a bit of traffic, although, again, you can see lots of clear air for these guys. They may not even catch the GTEs before the end of the race now. So there is one, I believe, uh, coming through towards 130R at the moment. They may catch later, mm. but I don't think one GTE car is going to cause too much trouble. Touch wood, of course, because I really hope I don't uh, curse these guys to a terrible end to what has been so far an excellent race. <laughs> and that's the thing with the commentators, Chris. We, we do have a uh, habit of unfortunately talking about the cars and then something happens. But as we were watching Guilford still close out the back and get dishes, so coming down in the back straight at the moment. As they come down into the Casio Triangle, Dushito takes the in, going to be taking the inside line, I reckon, on this one, Chris. And he's going to be defending. Oh, no, he still settles into his line. And Guildford just settles single file, Chris. What do you reckon? First turn, Guildford's going to make his move? Well, it looks like Dushito's got a decent exit, although I think Guildford is probably running uh, mm. a slightly lower downforce setup here. He actually, if anything, he caught up too quickly because he had to lift off a bit through 130R because as we've seen already in the LMP2s, it's really not a place to be making an overtake with so many other better places available. And this, you know, a second place finish is still brilliant. Um, and yeah, Guildford, Guildford's using different tactics at the moment here and he's just tucking in behind Dushito. No real need yet to worry because there's still 13 minutes left. I think Guildford can trust in his pace, although Duchateau's driving so far, the defending has been brilliant. It's been firm, it's been fair, and he's still got the lead of this race. Yeah, and he did give up the position very easy because he, he could have quite easily backed off going into the S's there, and he didn't. He, he kept his foot in, kept it clean, left, left Guildford room. So the, the really, it's, the, there's nothing to be actually going for it. It's going to be interesting. I think we're going to keep an eye on the moment. So we've got P1 with Will Woodland there, still sliding through his GCs, comes in the Casio Triangle. Will got, obviously, the uh, better side of the uh, pit stops that happened, didn't he, Chris? We've got Corbs in P2 there as well. He is now nine seconds back from Woodland, Chris. That's kind yep. of unexpected. Labatti in third, he's a further five seconds back at the moment. Again, we got James Armstrong, he's 37 seconds behind Labatti. Again, struggled with the pit entry. Taylor Mills, another one that was involved in that, unfortunately. He's sitting in spin. We've got Reddington in sixth. Max Hack is sitting in seventh at the moment. He's coming into the traffic, the LMPs. It's going to be an interesting finish with 11 minutes to go, Chris, isn't it? It's going to be traffic management. And uh, as we jump back on board, we've still got the Chateau defending for his life from Guildford as they come down the start finish straight. Guildford doesn't seem as close this lap, Chris, as he did in the last one. No, I think Duchateau's just settled down a little bit here. He's just pumped out a very quick lap there, a 1.45 dead. That was two, nearly three tenths quicker than Guildford on the last lap. Mm. And that's going to be good for him. It just gives him a little bit of breathing room there. Um, and we're also, you know, this, this battle's so compelling, we've not even really been able to watch the Izzo Studensky battle as we're going to look at a Carmo incident here. James, let's see what happens.
to oh, to, to, oh, to touch the elevator because yep and okay yep so yeah there was a there was a touch there between the lmp2 and the gt gt just having to take the uh, rally cross line around the end of the s's and all the way around to degna but i think at this point in the race as frustrating as that is it wasn't necessarily for position and now we've got the gosling colocott battle in gte this is for 10th in gte yeah as they come down into the casio triangle there with Dan gosling pulls out on colocott Again, Chris, I don't think he's going to be making his move here. I think he's going to be looking at going down the, coming down into the first turn. Danny goes in, setting in nicely behind Colocott as he comes down into the, coming down the start, finish straight now. Gosling again, sitting in behind him, Chris. I think he's going to make his move late. But again, he's got the LMP2 coming up beside him as well. And, and Gosling passes Colocott down into the first turn. Instantly again, ooh, that Porsche is, is yeah, it's, it's going to be... A bit of a manic one there for Gosling, but he managed it well, Chris, as he goes through the S's with, with a move done on Colicott there for 10th place. Yep, the added stress of uh, the LMP1 of Pizzo there, who isn't really racing anyone, so I don't think he necessarily needed to get involved there, but it, you know, no harm, no foul. Uh, we can go back now to the LMP1 battle, which, again, Duchateau is, is just very slowly and calmly edging that gap back out again. It's up to seven tenths now. Again, he was a, another tenth and a bit quicker on the last lap than Guildford. Guildford is just ever so slowly not able to make these challenges. He's not able to put that little bit of extra pressure on Duchateau, and we've only got nine and a half minutes plus whatever's left on the last lap to go. Guildford's actually going to begin to run out of time, and that's going to shift the pressure more onto Guildford and less onto Duchateau. So we'll see what happens there, James. Yeah, I think Duchateau's now sitting there. He's looking quite comfortable. He, he can see Guildford just sort of going further back. Again, Guildford's having to move aside to let the LMP1 through, but he hasn't let him through coming into the hairpin there. I think the LMP one's going to run around the outside. Guildford hasn't lost a massive amount of time as they come down into Spoon. But again, he's well, he's opened up to 0.84, Chris. When's he going to be looking? Is he going to be sitting back thinking, I'm going to go again? Or is he going to be getting that second wind that most of us do as a racer driver and really try and get back up to the back of Dushito with eight minutes to go? Yeah, that is going to be quite frustrating for him with this traffic. Is that that little bit more of a gap he's still within the draft but he's gonna have to really push now if he wants to get back right as close as he was four or five laps ago uh Duchateau is is really really driven very well since he had to defend into turn one a few laps mm. ago he's driven about as perfectly as you can and again i'm gonna touch my desk because it's made of wood because i really don't want to curse him here he's had such a good race and he's only got eight minutes left to try and make sure he gets the lmp2 win <laughs> but has he is he got in the car chris after completing that S's defence against Guildford. Has it given him that lift of confidence that he can sit there and think, I can actually do this, I can drive this guy, I can keep Guildford behind me, I'm going to try and work as hard as I can as it. As he comes through the S's again, again, Guildford's still sitting there, but the gap's come down now to 0.4 of a second. So Guildford has made his move. Is this should say now going to be relaxing and thinking, I've done it before, I can do it again? Well, I think I'm just going to overly psychoanalyze it here. <laughs> uh, Duchateau did pit two laps later than Guildford, so they wouldn't have taken tyres. They were only stopped for 22 seconds, but it just allows you to mentally reset when you just sat there in the pit box, and that means his sort of second stint here, it's only seven laps compared to Guildford's um, nine, as it will be, or ten, actually, we're on the lap now. Mm. And I think, you know, just that little bit of extra time to reset your mind, refocus, he's effectively sort of got two laps of more mental mental energy left although again i again commentator's curse he's just had an off track on the exit of the hairpin although guildford's not really taking advantage of it here there's not a huge difference in straight line speed as it comes through mm. into spoon but of course he's still got all this rough advantage and yeah we've got one gte to contend with here and then i think we'll have a look at another charlie bebb off track he's uh, he's found a way to get into the broadcast split and that's through having lots of incidents today unfortunately for charlie but we'll have yes. a look at that once they get through cleanly here so we'll see what happens to charlie now hopefully and yep so he's all on his own as he's coming up towards degna and now he's gonna be another victim to the degna curbs taking degna one all right and he's just taking a bit too much speed into degna two lost the rear end and just ghosted himself into the barrier there. Uh, so he has been able to get back out again. It's now the gap down to four tenths, James. Are we? Let's see what's going to happen here. Yeah, I think Guildford now again, because he's got that second win. He can, he can see the Chateau. He's now going to get that second win back. 
And I think, you know, Guildford took that breather time in a, a few laps back where he opened up the gap to 0.6 of a second. I think now he's really pushing on. He's got six minutes to go. Plus what they're on the last lap. I think he's, he's going to be now putting Dushto under pressure. And Dushto's really got to be feeling it. As they come down, ooh, Gosling, have that. Who's on the side there? Was that Gosling going off, Chris? And that was number 31 as well, I think. That was uh, Colocott, I believe. Uh, oh, as we've got more incident here, blimey. It's all going on. Yeah, that's allowed Guildford to catch up there, Chris. That was like, he's come right at the back of this so the LMP one's gonna be weaving around the outside with GT he's going off all in one strike. It yep. takes a lot mentally as these guys come in now. They've been going for fifty five minutes. Mentally, Guildford's got to be in a position to hold it, hold his nerve to catch up to the back of this show, isn't it? It really does, although one thing that didn't help there, Guildford locked up on the entry into the hairpin, which is going to have compromised his exit when he really could have used that extra draft he would have received. Although, of course, for the start of that, Duchateau would have had the toe from the LMP, so that would have slightly mitigated the issues he was having there. Mm. Uh, but again, that gap is down to less than half a second. We've still got, I think, three or four laps to go. This is anyone's race, really. Um, the other two classes have pretty much sorted themselves out. Kolobuksov's got a five-second gap to Verdolivo, and uh, Woodland's still got a five-second gap to Kerbs as well. So um, if they can keep it on the track, as producer Sean uh, says, then the race is kind of in those two classes. It's pretty much sealed. It's Dushato and Guildford who are really sort of still trying to work it out between them. Um, yeah, I don't think... I think... I think Woodland's got, uh, he's got five seconds over Curbs. Now, we know Curbs was, was the fastest car on the track at the moment. So I thought that would have been a little bit closer as, as, as obviously we've been focusing on the Dushito Guildford battle, but I, I would have thought Curbs might have gone a little bit closer to Woodland. But then again, it, Woodland's now settled into his line, hasn't he, Chris? It's late on. And it's really opened up that gap since the, the pit stop. Yeah, he really has. I've been a bit surprised with that. I think Curbs must have more damage than we thought. Um, last lap, Woodland was five tenths quicker. But, of course, Curbs' is, um, best lap is a full eight tenths quicker than what Woodland has managed. And, of course, Woodland is car number 17. So he'll be... And that's five places gained from his grid position of six. And this has been an excellent race for Woodland. He can be very pleased with what he's done. Cars number three and one behind him. He can. This is this is a win for the ages, really. Again, let's not talk too soon. There's still three and a half minutes to go. Plenty could happen. Um, Ooh, Guildford takes a wide... Uh, I'd say he takes a wide line there, Chris. But I think he uh, overran himself coming into Spoon. Um, that's unlucky. He's now dropped back on that about 1.1 seconds. Are we looking at LMP2s now with Dushito? Three minutes to go. Guildford looking a bit nervous, Chris, would you say, coming this late in? Yep, and he had a GT in the way through 130R just to compound the misery that has been the second half of this lap for him. He's now out of the draft. He's really going to gonna have to take an incident with Dushito for him to catch back up at this point, I would have thought. And look, just Dushito taking no chances, making sure that Guildford does not have any access to his draft whatsoever. Um, well, I mean, obviously Guildford could have moved across, but Guildford mm. realises that he's not quite there. Uh, and so we've got some more of Roost battle here, James. Yeah, coming down into one valley. Oh, I think it's going to be interesting uh, coming up to the Casio there. Well, on with, with Roos again with Zamora. He, he doesn't really look like he's taking an offensive line. He's, he's kind of looks like he's almost setting him up coming down into first turn there, Chris. You know, he, he nestled straight in behind him, took his line. Zamora went on a defensive, and I think this could be Roos's corner. If he can get close that back gasp up as soon as he can, is he going to be looking at the inside? I, I, no, that's the problem there, because he? once he goes up, sits behind him in first turn, it's going to be all the way to the hairpin now, unless Zamora has an issue going through the S's, which I can't see that happening. So Roos is again going to be stuck behind coming into the, uh, into the hairpin. And what's he going to be looking at? Down the back straight again, coming into the Casio Triangle. So that would have been another lap that he would have been sitting behind, behind Riss as well. And obviously Zamora's last lap was a 145.4. Riss's was a 144.8. So a massive jump in lap times there, Chris, which that's why Riss really closed up onto the back of Zamora. Yep, and uh, I think that might well be traffic again. Um, we'll see what happens here, of course. Very little time left, depending on, I think, looking at where Woodland is. We are on the penultimate lap now. Uh, so these guys, we might start seeing some very aggressive moves into the prime op overtaking opportunity spots because there's just so few opportunities left. So 
Is Roos going to gamble and make a very aggressive overtaking move? Because, of course, he's got 30 seconds back to Lemayne. So he can kind of afford to... Like, this is maybe a slightly cynical and reductive way of looking at it, but he can kind of afford to take them both off the track for 10 seconds. It's, it's almost worth the attempt just for the extra position. Uh, but, of course, don't forget these are official races, and for those... Those gentlemen interested in uh, their safety rating are not going to want to do that. So we'll have to see how much their safety rating means to these drivers with some of the moves they might make on what will now possibly be the white flag lap. It depends on... Oh well, yeah, we've got 40 seconds left, so I don't think Woodland is going to manage two-thirds of the track in that time. So we are really rapidly running out of time to make a move here as the GT just gets in the way. Yeah, and I think that's the thing. I wouldn't want to... From my point of view, I wouldn't want to be driving an hour. Yes, I might be right up behind the guy in front, but would you really want to risk that hour's work that you've done, Chris? Um, I've been on the receiving end of people who want to get that extra position, and I've just let them have it because, yeah, I, the, sw the sweat and the tears you put into these races, you want to be rewarded with a finish, for sure. As the clock has just ticked down to zero, and Woodland has just got Spoon 130R and the Casio Triangle to contend with, and he will have a very nice victory indeed. Yeah, he's got Chaffee again there with it, the, but I don't think he's going to really have much issues with that. Whoa, we got Spinner in the background. That looks I think like that was Valor. Yep, yeah, Antonio Valor just as he's being overtaken there, and it looks like he's another one who's really struggled in Degna there. It does seem to be affecting the GTEs. Slightly offline because of the prototype behind him, and he's jumped to the pits, sadly, for him. He won't have actually lost. I think he lost three positions for that. I think he was ahead of Collicott, so Collicott, Watson's yeah, in. Yeah, as we come round, Woodland now, Chris. Sorry, cut you off. We've got Woodland coming round, and Cassio trying. He's finished down the start, finished straight. Woodland is your LMP winner in the Endurance Sprint Series at Suzuka. And Corb's coming in in second place, 7.96 seconds behind Chris. It's really yep. quite unexpected. Yep, from the first half of the race, I think that's quite a big surprise. I'm guessing Kerbs must have, while lapping someone, it looks like there's been an issue for him because he definitely took a lot longer in the pits than the only other LMP1 that didn't have an issue, Labati, which was 15 seconds and Woodland's 12 seconds. So obviously something happened to Kerbs there. We see the damage to the back of his car. Mm. Uh, the LMP2s have been so, you know, they were not that far uh, ahead of Woodland. So they've got a whole more lap to do here. Duchateau has still got uh, several tricky corners to worry about here, and Guilford's caught straight back up to him, James. Yeah, I think that Duchateau there hit the curb there, Chris, just unsettled him. As he comes down now, running into 130R and down into Spoon. It's going to be an interesting end, I think. Uh, Guilford's got the position at 0.3 of a second. As he goes through Spoon now, he's close right up the back of Duchateau. Again, is he going to be looking at jeopardising this hour's run, or is he going to be settling for second, Chris? Personally, I would sell for second. Do you agree? I, I also don't have the race of spirit that these guys clearly do, and you and I don't. There's a reason we're in the commentary booth, I suspect. This is exactly the thing. He's coming to the Casio Triangle. we got Guilford now still sealing behind Dushito, and I believe this is going to be Dushito now as he comes round the last corner. Guilford hasn't got any answer for him, Chris. I think Dushito there wins the LMP2s. Be careful there, mate. Oh! Nice yeah. there as he comes over the finish line. Oh, yeah, that was... Um, I, that, that, if that was me, Chris, I probably would have ended up putting it in the barrier. But Dushito is obviously a lot more uh, capable than I am. We've got Collar Box off there, wins the GTE series, Chris. Outstanding race. Outstanding. A complete unexpected winner in Woodland in LMP1s. Really did get the good end of the pit stops there, Chris. Yep, if you go by I rating, Woodland is actually the lowest I rating gentleman in the LMP1 class, and we can run through the classes now if you'd like to, James. Yeah, we got Will Woodland coming in in first place in LMP1, Jan Corbs in second, Labati in third, James Armstrong in fourth, Taylor Mills in fifth, Andre Reddington in sixth, Daniel Pizzo in seventh, and Max Hack in eighth in LMP1s. LMP2s, we had the great defensive drive of Didier Dichetto there. Absolutely outstanding to keep Robert Guilford in second place. Alessandro Izzo, Jan Stadinsky in fourth. Uh, Andre Barilaro in fifth. Zamora in sixth. Bruce in seventh. Lemayne in eighth. De Jong in ninth. Chivron in tenth. Beb, unfortunately, had a few off tracks in 11th. 
and Cora down in 12th there. Absolutely out. Yeah, after that big accident he had as well, but absolutely outstanding battle there with Didier Duchateau. Um, Collar box off in GTE, comes out GTE winner. Orimus in second, Verdolivo in third, Decanter in fourth, Simno in fifth, Carmo in sixth, Rulio in seventh, Maffo in eighth, Danny Gosling in ninth, Mark Collicott in tenth, Francois Watts in eleventh, Zendrikov in twelfth, Vare in thirteenth, who had that spin and forty down in Degna, and Edward all day down in fourteenth place, six laps down. So that concludes our evening for the, for the European Sprint Series for the first race at Suzuka. Absolutely amazing race for me and Chris and everybody else here within Total Sim Sport. We are on to Spa, Frank's Shop Circuit in Belgium next week. Next Thursday, same time, 10 p.m. live on the Total Sim Sport YouTube channel. Please hit the subscribe button, turn on those bells for notification, and me and Chris will see you.